My life has been an orgasmic affair of highs and lows. In this exciting journey of life so far, I came across several individuals from whom I learned some basic principles of success, principles of living life peacefully, living the life of purpose. Some of these individuals, I met with them briefly. Few of them I associated for a significant period of time. Few others, I read about them. Each of these individuals has something unique to offer. And at this juncture, I thought it's the best time to kickstart in conversation. A dialogue with some of these select individuals. These individuals have come from different strata of our society globally. As I discuss with these individuals the secrets behind their success in life, come and join me. Welcome to In Conversation. My guest today on this inaugural episode of In Conversation is Dr. Marcos Rigas de Silva. Marcos and I, we knew each other for more than two decades now. When I met him for the first time as the program officer at the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal, I was impressed with his charismatic personality. But I was also impressed with his ability to be accommodative, inclusive, and embracing any new individual that he comes and meet with. As I sat down for in conversation, I began by asking Marcos about his childhood. Well, I, I was born in Rio de Janeiro, and I'm very fortunate because part of my family are native born Brazilians, and another part immigrated to Brazil immediately after the war from Italy. So it was a very multicultural uh, family, although Brazil is a very multicultural country. So it was multicultural atop of multicultural. And it taught me a love for cultural differences, for different cuisines, for different ways of seeing things, but also the ability of stepping back in viewing your own country and your own culture as perhaps someone outside of it is able to do. And I really consider that a privilege because you can see very clearly the benefits, but also some of the drawbacks that a culture can have. And um, immerse yourself in those actions that you think would be most beneficial overall. So I'm very thankful for the early family background that I've had. And just in line with that, how has been your relationship with the parents? Any specific memories? My mother was a very exceptional woman, a feminist before the word even existed. Uh, extremely intelligent, uh, lifelong love of education and learning. Uh, she gave me the love of reading. Uh, and most of all, she taught me independence. Um, it was a single family uh, uh, during those years, which was rather difficult because they weren't as common as they were today. But we were also very close to my uncle and aunt. Uh, my uncle was Italian. And um, from them, I, I, I learned a lot, like love of family, the, uh, the ethics of work, uh, 
the ability to merge, the ability to be an outsider, but also be part of a community. So I consider myself very fortunate for the family background that I had. Well, I moved to the United States still as a child. And I think one of my most challenging moments was going in as a South American in a purely American school in what then was still segregated Virginia. And uh, I think that taught me uh, really what bias, prejudice, uh, it, it taught me what good, how good people can stand up in a system that is unjust and how you can fight uh, in a situation that really goes against everything that you had assumed would be. Mm -hmm. And any blissful moments, the moments that you cherish till date? Uh, I love sports. And um, I, I think sport, I, I think sports in, in many ways shaped the way I view things. And I think the one lesson that sports have taught me, actually two lessons. One, teamwork is essential for success. Right? You have to understand your team. Uh, you have to understand your teammates and you have to act as a team. And second, that it's okay to win. And I know that sounds funny, but I, I learned that it's all right to feel good, to win at something, to be the best at something. And that you should always strive at that within the context of your team. Now, I went to some very good universities. I uh, started in the United States uh, at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, State University of Virginia. But then I moved to Canada, where I went to Concordia University and McGill University, where I got my doctorate. So these are, these are very good universities, and um, I'm very pleased to be able to be part of that academic setting. Mm -hmm. So you had an elementary experience in uh, Brazil, and then you came to United States of America. That's in right, those, high school. High, for the high school, yes. In those transitionary moments or transitionary period, any difference that you could reveal for yourself that A is good, B is not good? The resources in the United States are incredible. Mm -hmm. It's an absolutely rich country. It's an incredibly innovative country. Um, one of the things that I admire the United States very much is their public library system. You can go to any small town and they'll have a free public library where anyone can go in and read a book. I, I, I think that's one of the things that gave the United States strength. The second thing I think that gave the United States strength is its ability to self-reflect and to criticize itself towards a more perfect union. I think the um, demonstrations that you see against racism is, is a manifestation of the self-reflection that the United States is undergoing right now. On the other hand, um, when I arrived in the United States, it was a segregated society. Right. I lived in the southern part of the United States. My, my school was, I was the first Latino in the school. Uh, it, uh, there were no blacks uh, when I first arrived. Uh, in the later years, they started to arrive. Uh, we, they would sing Dixie in, in the classroom, <laughs> the, the southern anthem. And I, I think it, I see that part as very negative because it was almost a denial of the economic system that that part of the United States was based on, which was human exploitation. And it's only now, I think, only through the civil rights era, which I consider the, one of the shining moments in the United States, and what you see right now, that they're really coming to terms with 
what occurred. And I think the legacy, the racist legacy, cultural le racial legacy that people carry with them and they may not be aware of it. Oh, so, so again, I mean, it was a huge swing, I would say, from law to cognitive science to artificial intelligence to computing. What, what made it to have such a broad swing? So jumping from one discipline to another, to me, it wasn't really all that difficult. And one of the things that I absolutely adored about cognitive science was that it was truly one of the first transdisciplinary disciplines ever, because it's a mixture of computer science, artificial intelligence, psychology, neurology, education, uh, and, and a host of other uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. And you're able to choose and mix the approach that you wish. Right? You want to understand how people think, how people read, how do kids solve problems, uh, and, and so on and so on. There's, there's a wide array of areas of studies. Mm -hmm. And um, it fit very well the, uh, the approach that I've always believed in education, which is not basically to stamp out an idiot savant, but to give you the ability to think critically about issues and immerse yourself in a um, topic that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm very pleased I did so because one of the reasons I'm able to work in biodiversity is this openness to different ways of thinking, to different disciplines, mm -hmm. and really to understanding how everything really fits in one large web of life. I entered the multilateral world purely by accident. I, I was a librarian, a computer services librarian, and an adjunct professor at McGill University. And at the time, I was responsible for the internet or introducing the internet to students and to faculty, because this is uh, you know, the mid to late 80s. People didn't know very much about it. And uh, this person entered my office and started asking me questions about networking and the internet and how to use it and so on. And I assumed there was someone from the private sector because back then the universities would sell uh, mainframe time to private companies because mainframes and computing was so expensive. We, we forget that, right? With our smartphones today. <laughs> and um, turned out she was a headhunter and a few months later, I got a call to um, uh, set up the information system of the North American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. Mission on Environmental Cooperation, the side agreement to the NAFTA Treaty, yeah. to set up their computer and information systems mm -hmm. for the three countries. Mm -hmm. And I entered as a consultant and I, two years later, I was offered a full-time job and I left the university. It's one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, the conventional biological diversity moved in the same building on the floor above. Hmm. Calestius Juma was then the executive director. I don't know if you remember him, uh, Shavon. Yeah. You must have met him. I do, yeah. yeah. And... Um, he used to meet with me and seek my advice on a number of issues like uh, networks and, and, and things like that. And um, the person who was then the, uh, responsible for an article of the CBD in the convention, Article 18, uh, which was the Clearinghouse Mechanism, 18.3, on technical and scientific cooperation, left the post. And I, I applied and I moved from one floor to the other. <laughs> so it's really by chance that, um, that I entered the multilateral world. But once I was in the UN, 
I, I just adored it. I, look, I have no illusions about the problems that the United Nations has, mm -hmm. the drawbacks, the challenges, but yet I have deep admiration for the work it does, for the way it reaches decisions, uh, for the efforts that it makes. Uh, no bureaucracy is perfect. You know that it's a huge bureaucracy, but it does its best. The people that I've met in the United Nations are top class, absolutely top class. Yeah. And um, um, also the work they do for the environment, I, I, you have to understand just how complex reaching a decision regarding environmental conservation and sustainable uses. It's not a matter of, it's not black and white, it's gray. Yeah. And that forum that exists, whether it's the CED, UNFCCC, UNEP, uh, you know, all, all of these different organisms do provide very, very sustainable decision-making uh, structures that allow us to move forward. Perhaps we're not moving forward quickly enough. Perhaps we've reached the crisis stages or these mechanisms are insufficient, but I see no other way. Uh, once I retired from the United Nations, I was offered the job of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. It's, it's a regional organization, it's a unique organization because mm -hmm. it's based on science and um, we fund transdisciplinary research. Quite right. Uh, in the Americas. And I, I, again, I'm very fortunate to have this post mm -hmm. because I do feel that I'm able to make a contribution from the Arctic all the way to Patagonia. Well, one of the courses that touched me most was a course in literature. Ever since that course, I always try to look at the structure and one of the things that has taught me is that we seem to focus on differences, differences between cultures, differences between people. Some people are short, some people are tall, some people are darker, some people have blonde hair, some people, and so on and so on. But if you scratch the surface, we're very much alike. And if you were to compare things, there are many more similarities than there are differences. Uh -huh. Yeah, was. if we sat down, we could speak about a billion differences between the two of us. We're born in different continents. We speak different languages other than English. Uh, we've had different education. But if we start talking about the similarities, I am sure we probably share the same worldview. We probably share the same cultural underpinnings. We probably share the same love of education and learning. We probably, I think, the correlations and the similarities would be endless between the two of us. And if you start searching for similarities instead of differences, it really gives you a different outlook on problem solving, on meeting challenges, on facing difficult situations, uh, difficult people perhaps. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a whole new ball game. Mm -hmm. And if I have the point in an educational, I'm going to say, an, an experience that I think I have immensely profited from was not a class in computer science, was not a class in systems, in networks, neurology, psychology, it was a class in literature, humanities. You make a very interesting point, and that, that is something that people must pick up from this conversation, is that don't look at the differences. Look at the similarities, and then you would realize that the continental distance, distance of race, distance of, distance of caste, creed, religion, actually blurs down very quickly. In the core of it, we are very similar. And that's exactly. what probably makes us a single species called human being. It's not only about the education that shapes you. Your associations too shapes you. And the intimate association makes much stronger impact on us. And intimate not in sense of physicality, but intimate in sense of 
uh, emotions, the feelings, uh, likings, if you could uh, ascribe that way. You're, you're absolutely right. A, a university is not so much just learning. It's an acculturation. It's an entry to a, a city of scholars. Right? And I've always considered cities mm -hmm. incredibly uh, creative environments. Like everything comes from cities, uh, literature, political movements, mm -hmm. uh, civil wars, trade. In a city of scholars, the university is in fact a mini city that allows for the innovation. I think that's why it survived as an institution for what, 2000 years or so or more? Even more, yeah. I mean, uh, the universities in India, the Nalanda or the Buddhist universities are dating back much beyond that yeah or the, right. or the or the that, that is centuries old that survives absolutely the gurukul system that we have in india were actually mini universities in that sense yeah so as a young person and we'll say you know uh, people enter the university at various stages of their life but since we're speaking of me, let's say as a young person, it's a new acculturation. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, it's living with people of different backgrounds, uh, different ethnicities, different languages. It is trying to learn how to argue or how to bring forth a point, something you're passionate about but within a same, certain framework of respect for others. Uh, it's, it's, it's learning to, to look at the challenges that you have in life from a very critical and self-aware perspective. And I think the university brings, provides very much to a person. Uh, I, I think it's a gift for those that are able to experience this culture. Mm -hmm. Even even if you don't graduate, I think the acculturation that you go through, the learning that you go through, the, the changes that you experience will mark you for life. Right? When I arrived at the UN, the resources, they weren't limited, but they weren't as generous as you had in the university. You also have the cutting edge resources that you had at the university, and you also had an inequitable environment where some countries had incredible resources and others uh, lacked access to technologies and being able to use them equitably. On the other hand, um, you're right, it's a very bureaucratic, very procedural, very hierarchical world, almost like an army. Mm -hmm. But if you remember our years in the informal advisory committee to the Clean House Mechanism, we basically drafted decisions to the, to the governments, which comprise the conference of the parties, that are often adopted, which means that a low-level bureaucrat like myself, could have input on global decision uh, that would have to be implemented at the national level, meaning that you could influence the direction of how technologies were being world were being used. And I think at the time, our group that we had, what we called the, the IAC informal advisory group. Mm -hmm. It was really composed of an incredible number of people from the United States, from Mexico, India, uh, Belgium, uh, and, and um, uh, a few other countries. And the vision that this small group mm -hmm. was able to articulate and be discussed at the global level, I think, laid the foundation for how bioinformatics and technologies are being used today in the biodiversity world. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you discuss issues like open data, open access to data, 
interoperability, uh, single standards, standards like the Durham Core, uh, thing, things like that. Many of the beginnings uh, for governments to adopt mm -hmm. happened, in, happened in the early years, uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000. Mm -hmm. And it was because of work of people like you, mm -hmm. I think, speaking for the governments that allowed this to flower. Share with us uh, your experiences, good or bad, uh, or lessons learned from interacting with uh, multiple nationalities, people having different agendas. It's working with countries to be able to reach a compromise where everyone is comfortable and everyone loses a little bit, but everyone gains a little bit as well. That is the role of an, inter to a, of an international civil servant to assist countries to reach that level of dialogue. So yes, it is very difficult. It is very challenging. Sometimes you fail. I think 623, the invasive species decision is a failure since it didn't reach consensus. The sharks I see as a success because it did pass. Uh, uh, but you'll always have that situation in that, and again, she was. I want to emphasize that that is the role of an international civil servant, is to provide governments with the space to articulate their needs to be able to reach a compromise. 95% of the time, compromise is reached. Other times, it's not. Mm -hmm. I am very disappointed that some countries are withdrawing from the multilateral process, that they believe that it's not necessary. I, I think it's a grave mistake. I, I think sooner or later they'll come back to the table, understanding that this is the mechanism that we have to make things work, as bureaucratic and hierarchical it may be. But that is the system and those are the lessons that I've learned. First of all, be aware of your biases. I have biases just like everyone else. I believe in certain things just like everyone else. But when you approach a government, when you approach a delegate, you have to dis disassociate yourself from those beliefs and try to understand the person's point of view with as much objectiveness as possible. It's extremely difficult, right? It's, it's not easy, but you have to have empathy for that point of view, regardless of how against it may go against your own beliefs. Second, you have to understand that that is only one point among 190, if we use the CBD as an example, I believe it's 193 countries, 194? Mm -hmm. let's, let's say 193, of 193 different viewpoints that must be weaved and articulated into something that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So again, you must be able to absorb many different viewpoints and see where the commonalities are. And again, this is another strength I think an international civil service should have is to search for the commonalities and ignore the differences because the commonalities are very often stronger than the differences. And once those are able to, are, to be articulated and understood, this is where countries come together and hammer out a compromise. Mm -hmm. You also traversed across the globe, work in different social setups. Any distinct observations that the location change brings changes into the social fabric, values, ethics, and that affects or influence the organization's culture? Excellent question, Vishwas. Um, I would argue that the culture of an international civil servant is stable regardless of the region we are at. You learn to be a, international civil servants aren't born, you learn to become one. You learn to disassociate yourself 
from uh, that culture and able to look at it critically and again, search for the commonalities in the areas where need is most urgent. I would argue that if you scratch the surface, the commonalities again are the same. Urgency uh, to alleviate poverty, for instance, is the primary term in our societies. Uh, the fight against corruption, uh, the fight for a decent job, the fight for sustainable use and conservation of the ecosystem for which so much depends on, these things are common to our cultures regardless of how outwardly the way we articulate it or we manifest the work is. And your role as an international civil servant is to look beyond these, uh, how can I say, um, these very superficial uh, cultural manifestations, but go deeper and try to understand the needs of your culture, try to have empathy for those that you work with, try to understand their viewpoints, and try to align them with different regions and different subregions for the articulation of a common vision. And you'll find that it is possible to do so that people and cultures have, again, and, I, and I, won't, I keep emphasizing this, people and cultures have much more in common than they have differences. The inequalities that we have in our cultures, in our societies, right, that is, at least for the global south, that is the priority right now. Mm -hmm. Now, that's going to become very difficult with COVID-19, with economic systems collapsing, with, with unemployment at skyrocketing rates. And this is where the multilateral system has to kick in and to provide mutual support. How does Marco Silva manage to reach out to his own inner universe and listen to those inner voice amidst the noise around? How does he do that? Vishwas, I think we have been speaking primarily of respect. Respect for other cultures, respect for others, empathy, and the ability to work together. As an individual within billions and billions of people, I think it's my self-awareness of the culture that I grew in, the respect that I learned for others and the respect for myself, in the work ethic uh, towards a common good that I believe allows me to have the respect for others in the ability to assist them into articulating a common vision. So how do you manage a rebellion within yourself vis-a-vis -vis somebody who is self-aware or respectful? I'll give you a, a, a work example. Um, I used to work for the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES. Mm -hmm. We regulate commerce in species to make sure that the species doesn't become endangered in its ecosystem. Uh, that trade, international trade, is not detrimental to their survival in the ecosystem. We were, they have a series of permits that must be issued if trade is allowed. So if you want to take rosewood, from Brazil, for example, you would need to apply to the CITES authority in Brazil. They would see if that export is detrimental or not. And if it's not, they would issue you a permit that allows trade to, to take place. My job at CITES was to convert those permits into electronic format. Now, it seems that would be an easy thing, but it was very much like introducing the internet, introducing new technologies, introducing new things to a very conservative world that was used to doing things a certain way, right? It took years of efforts. And certain countries were absolutely pioneers. I would mention the United Kingdom and Switzerland uh, and to uh, a degree, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, sorry, the Czech Republic were 
pioneers in moving that theme forward. Eventually, all the countries have adopted uh, electronic permits for trade. The way that we went about it is that we formed a committee. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the UN way of doing things. Right. But country by country, we visited, we made presentations, we show the data, we meet individually with the persons and try to convince them. But at the same time, having the respect, the self-awareness, the understanding of their point of view and why they would not wish to trade. Mm -hmm. Now, something curious, developing countries are very quick to pick that up. Um, countries have something called single window systems because if you export a flower or an automobile, the process is basically the same. A number of different permits that must be harmonized and all of those permits are being harmonized into something called the single window with the same data standards. Uh, it lessens corruption, it, less, it's, it uh, facilitates trade and so on and so on. And the developing countries very quickly understood that because they saw it not as an issue of sustainable use and conservation, but as a question of facilitation of trade. Right? And if you approached the developing countries in that argument saying that facilitation of trade could assist sustainable use, the movement would be very quick. Uh, yeah. Republic of Korea, South Korea, Singapore, Mozambique, Ghana have made tremendous uh, progress in facilitation of trade in electronic commerce, including CITES. European Union is still moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and a number of developed countries are still moving forward on it. So it, it, it shows you that it's the articulation of a need, it's an understanding of another person's viewpoint, and it's a merging of what you view as an important, uh, essential uh, topic mm -hmm. in the context of the needs of the particular environment that makes it so that makes it possible to move forward. I see a lot of books in the background. How much of reading has shaped you? Let's go back to our conversation, Vishwas, where we agreed that we're born in different, different continents, different languages and different cultures. And yet, if you scratch the surface, we're probably very similar in thought and action. I share with you a love of literature and books. I try to read every evening uh, at minimum of a half an hour because I have to read reports, uh, papers, email, text messages, and all of those annoying things. And yet I consider books and literature one of the most important elements of how I, what I've become as a person. Uh, I, I believe the right to read is one of the most important rights a human being can have. Mm -hmm. I think you reach liberation through reading. I think education is a human right that everyone should have access to. We all have ideals in our life. Any individuals, either in, from public life or from your close circles, that have made an indelible impression upon you or an influence to you? Well, speak of my personal life, because mm -hmm. I think well-known figures, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and, and others, uh, I think we share. Oh, I'll mention two people. One, one of my coaches, who I think was one of the most humane persons I've ever met in my life. He would help under, a, uh, under kids under very difficult situations learn self-respect and self-control and that, it's so, that they could achieve what they wanted. And second, one of my professors, uh, I took a class in theology and he was a Jesuit priest. And he was one of the most open, one of the most humane 
in one of the funniest people I have ever met. And he taught me that humor is one of the great uh, elements of life and how much you should appreciate it and seek it out in other people. Mm -hmm. I think those two persons are possibly two that I admire very much. If Marcos Silva has to be remembered for something, what would be that one thing that you would like Marcos Silva to be remembered in any sphere of life, I would say? I think the respect for learning would be the one thing I would most likely be remembered for. <laughs> How do you spend your leisure time? if you at all get it? Uh, I read a lot. Mm -hmm. I swim a lot. Uh, I try to meet a family. I love movies. My, my favorite film that I think is timeless is, Bic is The Bicycle Thieves by Victoria De Sica. Where, uh, this is, the film's very simple. A man and his son search for his stolen bike in post-war Rome. And, I think that film exemplifies the human condition better than any other movie I have ever seen. Uh, that's a leisure that I love doing. I, I love to swim. I think meditation must be like swimming because I'll start swimming, I'll start thinking, ah, oh, the water's too cold, I'm tired, why am I doing this? All of a sudden something clicks in. <laughs> and yeah. oh, when I wake up, I'll realize that a half an hour, 40 minutes have passed and I'm in a total state of bliss. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in leisure, I love speaking to people that will bring, that will challenge something I believe in, mm -hmm. that will create some sort of cognitive dissonance. What would be your key messages, two or three, to people who would like to jump into the conservation uh, research or uh, sustainable development uh, arena uh, to start with? First of all, keep an open mind. Don't go in with preconceived ideas because it's an incredibly complex world. Second, have self-awareness of your biases and your prejudices, the way you see things may not necessarily be the best solution or may, may uh, benefit from input from areas that you may not even thought of. Mm -hmm. think of. Think also that solutions are not as simple as they may appear to be and that a number of variables impinge on a final compromise. And then also that things that you never thought possible, in fact, are possible and that you can achieve. And lastly, don't lose faith. If you have to talk to a kid of about 10 years or so, uh, maybe, today or five years from now, what would be your two key sharings with the kid like of that age, eight to 10 years or something like that? Don't ever give up. Uh-huh. And look for what's best in people. I think we had an amazingly inward looking conversation. It was as if we were just uh, conversing across the table. My conversation with Marcus went on for a longer than what you could watch or listen to. And that is always a case. I hope you had lessons to learn, tips to grab. So stay tuned for the next episode of In Conversation. Till then, stay safe and continue to aspire.